Hello, New Prospect. Welcome to RTB 2021 for February 23rd, 2021. I hope you're doing well this day. So our texts for today are Job 23, X to 6, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and Luke chapter 9. So let's look at all these. Uh, we'll start with Job once again. Uh, you may be starting to get a little bit uh, worn out with Job, and that's purposeful, I think, on the part of the author. Uh, it's, it's drawing out this struggle to show, once again, that uh, how much of a struggle the issue of, of suffering and, and uh, ultimately uh, understanding the, the presence of suffering in the world is. Uh, and so he's not shying away from that struggle. Uh, but he is also, he's, he's drawing it, in fact, drawing attention to it. So Job 23, uh, we see Job uh, coming in. This is right after Eliphaz's last speech. And uh, in this speech, he is once again asking God for, a, um, for an audience. And we'll see this, this continual request coming before God uh, that he is, he's, uh, kind of bringing a legal dispute. And of course, this is heading forward to that kind of climax in the book when God reveals himself to, to Job at the end. Uh, he laments that God can't be found in verses 8 through 12. He uh, even extols God's greatness, but he also complains about uh, just the, the presence of injustice. So um, yeah, kind of continuing the same theme that we've seen throughout the book of Job so far. Over in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 6, we have uh, God answering Moses. Remember at the end of ch chapter 5, Moses had come to the Lord and said, you know, people are complaining, the, the Pharaoh has doubled the workload on them, and he's asking the Lord, why have you done this evil to this people? Why did you even send me? And God responds, as he's done several times for Moses now, with a assurance to Moses uh, that he will be their deliverer. And notice the way he talks about um, what he's going to do. Of course, he talks about how he's going to use uh, Pharaoh to bring them out. And again, remember that the, everything is heading towards bringing them out to Mount Sinai to form a covenant relationship with, with this people Israel. And then he says to Moses, this is what you need to say to them. I am the Lord. I will bring you up from the land, uh, from out from under the burdens of Egypt, and I will deliver you from slavery. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with, with great acts of judgment. Uh, really important concept in terms of just understanding our own salvation as this concept of redemption. And he says, and this is a really important phrase. He says, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know uh, that I am the Lord your God. This is a covenant formula. In other words, anytime God says, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people, that summarizes what it means to be in relationship to God. And that deep bonded relationship grounded in loyalty, love, and, and commitment uh, that undergirds the relationship that he has with God through, with Israel throughout the Old Testament, uh, that's summarized by the, just that one statement. It'd be just like saying uh, to your spouse, I am your husband and you're my wife. That summarizes that covenant relationship of marriage. Here, it summarizes God's covenant with Israel. And it's that commitment, that loyalty, that love, that this, the base and the promises that are the basis of that covenant relationship that is ultimately the basis of God's redemption. It's ultimately the basis of everything that God does throughout the rest of the book of Exodus. He's doing it so that they will know who he is, that he is the God who is creating them as a nation, as a covenant people to himself, and he's doing it ultimately to bring them into that relationship with him as a covenant people. Uh, so, uh, and we see this, by the way, throughout the rest of the prophets. And frankly, that's what God does in the new covenant context as well, that we are his people. He is our God. He brought us, he saved us, he redeemed us in order to bring us into a relationship with him. The chapter ends with a, a genealogy. Those are always fun. Uh, but this one is important because what it's doing is it's connecting Moses and Aaron with the patriarchs. So it's giving them that kind of authority and it's showing that they're transitioning to being under the authority of God himself. So let's move on to the gospel of Luke. Uh, so in Luke, we've got several important events. We've got some teachings of Jesus. Uh, we've got uh, some other uh, important uh, and well-known uh, of the of the miracles, and we can't deal with all these. Uh, but once again, I want to I want to focus on a couple of things. 
first of all, we have Peter's confession. So we know from the other gospels that this confession, although it's unstated here, this is probably at Caesarea Philippi, a northern part of Israel where um, where there, this was a, it was a Greco-Roman city, very much pagan. And uh, then the, this is where Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter responds that you are, um, you are the Christ, uh, the Christ of God. And then Jesus responds by foretelling his death. And then he instructs them to take up his, their cross and follow him. Again, we've seen this in other, other gospels. Uh, and we'll see this at the end where the disciples have a argument over uh, who's the greatest. Uh, and then Jesus once again responds by, uh, well, this before he, that, that argument on who's the greatest, Jesus again foretells his death. Then they have the argument. And then Jesus teaches them once again on discipleship. And this is the pattern you see in the Gospels. We've mentioned this before, that uh, Jesus teaches what he's going to do. And then he teaches the disciples in response, this is what you are to do. Discipleship is following in the pattern of the discipler, in this case, Jesus himself. And so what are we to do as believers in Christ, as followers of Christ, who have benefited from the work of Jesus on the cross? Uh, we are to take up our cross and follow him. That's the nature of discipleship. And again, sometimes we just kind of gloss over that and and don't consider the radical nature of that discipleship, taking up your instrument of death and following Jesus, giving your life to, to follow him. That's what discipleship is because you are following his pattern. Discipleship is becoming like the discipler. You also have the transfiguration in this text, which is uh, that once again, God affirming Jesus uh, as his son, as the Messiah, before he uh, goes to uh, his death. It's probably about six months before the, the uh, crucifixion. And so uh, this is God uh, once again affirming him, and it's also prefiguring uh, the second coming, ultimately. So some important texts here in Luke, and that finally brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And this is where Paul is talking about some dangers of idolatry, and this is kind of continuing the same discussion that we've had in chapters 8 and 9, where Paul is talking about the food offered to idols. And again, in that context, you could, it's really hard to get meat uh, that hadn't been offered to idols. So what does Paul end up saying? Well, he kind of addresses it in this way. He says that if you know that it's been offered to idols, uh, if it's a certain thing, uh, this is not a, a, an issue of Christian freedom anymore. You, you really need to probably avoid that. Flee idolatry and the appearances of idolatry, Paul tells them. Uh, and the, the, that idea of fleeing, you almost see the the picture of, of Joseph fleeing from Potiphar's wife, right? When he is confronted with this sin. And, and Paul says, you know, you're, you will give, be given the option to flee from that temptation. And, and you, uh, there is no temptation from, from which you cannot, cannot flee. Uh, then he says, well, you know, if, it, if you don't know, then it's okay to eat. Uh, but really the overarching thing that governs everything and, and, and governs all your actions. And this is uh, I think one of my favorite verses uh, of Paul's, and it's, it's really a verse that kind of helps us to, um, to, to navigate all things uh, for, for God's glory. Uh, and it says, uh, let me, we'll just read starting in uh, verse 23, reading out of the ESV here. All things are lawful, but not the, all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let the one who seeks his own good let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of its con of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, if you don't know what it's, where, if, if you eating something that's been offered to the idol in ignorance, that's fine. Uh, but not everything is helpful. Not everything that is lawful that you can do in your Christian free freedom is helpful. So if you know it is, avoid it. And he says, if, if it, one of you invites, uh, if one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're uh, disposed to go eat whatever is set before you without it, raising any question on the ground of conscience, but if someone says to you, this has been offered, to, offered in sacrifice to an idol, uh, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you or for the sake of the conscience. I do not mean for your conscience, but his. Uh, but why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced? Because 
uh, for which I give thanks. And here's the, here it is. So here's that kind of general rule that governs all things involving Christian liberty, and frankly, all things involving the decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. It's a great rule of thumb, isn't it? So whatever you do, if, if, if you're trying to decide, is this the right thing to do? Ask yourself the question, does this bring glory to God? If it does, uh, then, it's, then it's perfectly fine to do. If it doesn't, probably need to rethink what you're about to, to, uh, to engage in. So a uh, good text to meditate on and chew on on this day, February 23rd, uh, 2021. Hope you all have a great rest of the day.